Thank you for joining our next edition of all that was on our series. Um, we got on the board with the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement um, here at UNH. And I'm going to be joined by really impactful alumni who are involved with public policy, politics, and uh, social enterprise. Uh, we're going to have an interview with these folks that's going to be led by Michael Atling, who is the director of the Carson School of Public Policy. So thank you so much to all of you for your participation and being here to check with all of us. Um, I'm going to turn over the microphone really quick and remark for this to be as much of a conversation as possible. So if you look at the bottom of your, your screen, there's a Q&A feature. If you have any questions at all for any of our speakers, you want them to elaborate or anything, Please just pop your question, question into that Q&A and, and we will grab it and, and we will work it into the conversation. And with that, I will turn it over to Michael. Okay, I'm not sure everybody could actually hear all of what Jamie was saying. Can, can you guys hear me? Okay, you can hear me fine. It's a little, sorry about any technological problems uh, we're having right now. Um, so I'm Michael Etlinger. I do, I do direct the Carson School of Public Policy here at UNH, and we have uh, three great people uh, to talk about careers with impact policy, politics, and social enterprise. Um, I'm not going to do elaborate introductions of uh, our three uh, friends here to, uh, who we will be speaking with, because uh, I'm sure you'd much rather hear about their careers from them than me. Uh, I will just I, I will just say briefly who they are. We have uh, David Dixon, UNH class of 86. He's a partner with uh, Dixon Davis Media Group. We have Corley Kenna, class of 2000, who is the Senior Director of Global Communications and Public Relations for Patagonia Incorporated. And we have Brittany Weaver Matthews, who is uh, UNH class of 2010 and also uh, has her master's in public administration from UNH uh, uh, in 2015. And she's the senior policy advisor for education and workforce for uh, US Senator Maggie Hassan. And I also, uh, I came to UNH five years ago after a long career in uh, DC, mainly working at think tanks. And so I might chime in uh, if something comes up that seems relevant to my uh, uh, career. Uh, one thing I just wanted to note, because uh, someone had raised this, um, is that, uh, before we get started, is that uh, we will be talking about careers in policy, uh, politics, and social enterprise. We're not actually gonna be talking politics or policy. We do that in a lot of other contexts. And when we do that, we make sure we bring in people uh, with a wide range of views. Uh, the people we have uh, uh, on today happen to have uh, all worked at various times for Democrats. Um, but we're talking about careers and their parallel careers with impact uh, on the Republican side, among independents, and I think what you're gonna hear from them is useful no matter you know, what your, what your uh, views are. So um, with that said, uh, let me just start. Maybe we could each kind of go around the horn and have uh, each of you do maybe three minutes uh, summarizing uh, you know, what you do and where you are and uh, what your careers are like. And uh, in no particular order, maybe I'll start with uh, David, David Dixon. All right, thanks for having me. Thank you, Michael. Uh, David Dixon, I graduated from UNH in 1986 as a history major. And uh, I came to the college just, I think, looking for a sort of a liberal arts education. And in many ways, UNH made me the person I am today. I was politicized there I, uh, at UNH uh, by the presidential primary campaign that was taking place in, it was the 1984, uh, presidential primary, but I arrived there on campus in 1982, and the activities that were going on in and around UNH of the candidates showing up, the classes that were happening, really just sort of transformed my life in terms of what political campaigns meant, what communications meant, and uh, and it really sort of you know just sort of energized me and sort of changed my life. So I owe a lot to UNH, and and it's it's. Uh, it's a great thing that Michael and the Carsey School have done, and, and uh, I really appreciate uh, to be included in all this. Uh, once I left UNH, I, was, I wanted initially to be involved in environmental policy. I think uh, I wanted to sort of you know, work on campaigns to sort of do environmental policy, write laws, change, work for League of Conservation Voters, which I went to work for for a brief time. But then once I was in the sort of the policy League of Conservation world, I got sent out to a campaign and actually worked for Al Gore's presidential campaign the first time he ran. Uh, 
Uh, he, he ran in 1988 for president. I worked on Gore's presidential campaign in New Hampshire there, uh, working sort of doing some environmental stuff with LCV and Al Gore, really then understood what campaigns meant. Uh, that campaign obviously didn't go well that first time for, uh, for Senator Gore at the time. And I went on to work on a number of different sort of political campaigns across the country as a communications person. There, I met a couple of advertising people that did political advertising for the campaigns I worked on. And one of the, one of the folks that uh, I worked with in one of those campaigns hired me to open their Washington office of their advertising. Uh, a guy named Joe Slade White was the advertising guy. He was based in New York, and he hired me in 1989 to open his Washington office to deal with sort of the political clients that he had. I worked for him for three or two or three years, and there I really that was sort of my apprenticeship. I really learned about advertising, ad making, copywriting, filming, radio. Digital wasn't around at the time, and uh, that was a great experience for me. I went and did a little work on the party committees, and in 1985, I opened my own advertising. I was Dixon Media Group at the time. And then in 2000, I uh, brought a partner on it, a gentleman named Rich Davis. And ever since then, we've really done political ads all across the country, primarily in purple states initially. We did a lot of, you know, candidates, Kathleen Sebelius, uh, Democratic candidates, mostly, you know, in sort of these purple districts. And our firm has sort of grown into um, a firm now that has a number of senators and governors across the country. We are lucky enough to work for a lot of women senators. We do uh, Senator Hassan. We worked for Maggie when she was governor, also uh, did her Senate race. We worked for, uh, we just did Kirsten Sinema's race in Arizona. We uh, worked for uh, Senator Gillibrand, Senator Murphy in Connecticut, Maisie Hirono, Senator Stabenow. And we were also lucky enough in 2008 to be on the Obama media team. So we did ads in both 2008 and 2012 for the Obama campaign, uh, both nationwide ads and regional ads. And you know that's what my firm does today. We basically produce television, radio, and digital ads for political campaigns and some issue groups, some environmental groups, some education organizations, but it's primarily an electoral-based advertising firm. And so we make the ads uh, is the product that we sell, but we're also sort of strategic communications advisors to many of these campaigns. So that's in a nutshell what, what I do. Thank you, David. Uh, Coralie? Yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Corley Kenna. I, uh, like David, owe a lot to UNH. I'm originally from Georgia and um, went to UNH because it seemed like a nice place to be. And I developed a real interest in learning, I think, that I hadn't yet had and that I carry with me today. And just an intense curiosity about how the world works. And that led me to go intern on Capitol Hill the summer going into my senior year at UNH. I loved it so much and I had enough credits to go back and graduate early. It wasn't because I didn't love the school. It just felt like kind of the right thing to do. Um, got a job working for a senator from Georgia and then kind of would go between working on Capitol Hill and on campaigns. Um, ended up working for Hillary Clinton and um, on a few different campaigns. And my last gig in politics was um, at the State Department with her, um, where I had the great kind of pleasure of traveling the world and working on people-to-people -people diplomacy. Um, when I left government, I wasn't really sure what to do with any of the skills. Unlike David, I hadn't really honed any one perfect one. Um, so decided going to a PR agency might make some sense. Um, I went to a firm, one of the largest uh, PR firms in the world. It was then called Burson Marsteller um, and sort of cut my chops on in communications and learned the media world um, and sort of the understanding behind strategy um, in that space. Um, enjoyed that and thought, okay, this could be my career. Um, I took uh, a turn and went into retail and ran um, crisis communications for Ralph Lauren for a couple years and was really surprised when I got a call from a recruiter from Patagonia a few years ago and they said, you have this perfect 
um, background for what we're looking for, somebody with Washington experience, but also somebody with crisis and corporate experience and somebody with retail. So I was that funny unicorn. Um, and I think I had all of those experiences in many ways because of that sort of push for learning and curiosity that I got at UNH. So now I lead the communications team at Patagonia. So my team manages all of the product um, PR that we get, um, as well as all of the, if you read about any of the initiatives that we do, um, environmental initiatives, campaigns, um, things of that nature in the press, that's a product of, of my team. So thanks. Thank you, Corley. Uh, now we'll go to Brittany. Thank you. Uh, so I am originally from New Hampshire and uh, I didn't always plan on going to UNH, but it ended up the stars aligned and I always knew it was the right decision when I hit the ground running freshman year and really, uh, as David was talking about, started to dig into all of the political um, atmosphere that UNH had to offer during the presidentials. Um, and was there during uh, the 2008 presidential primary, actively worked on Hillary Clinton's race, um, actually became president of the College Democrats and was able to really dig in and work on the Obama campaign during the general election um, and was able to, to really get through the election cycle and look and say, oh, what else can I get from this college experience? Um, I was a dual major in political science and international affairs. Uh, so I was able to study abroad in uh, Italy and the Ascoli Pacino Italy, uh, I mean the UNH UConn program, um, which was amazing. And while I was there, I was uh, able to apply to be an intern at the State Department um, it, through the Washington Center program and was able to do that when I got back in the fall. And so that will be 10 years ago. Um, this uh, this year and it's kind of funny because I worked on the NATO team while I was there and today the Senate is voting to or yesterday the Senate voted um, to add Macedonia um, to NATO and that was something we were working on 10 years ago so it's certainly the full circle moments um, so I graduated in 2010 when there were not a ton of jobs out there because it was during uh, the the recession so really tried to use the connections that I had built at UNH um, and was able to get a job managing a state Senate race um, in the community. Uh, and that was amazing, had a great experience, was able to dig into all of the different facets of the campaign world from budgeting uh, to doing some communications work, fundraising, um, and then was able to really take that experience and be a campaign fundraiser for a couple of years, um, was a finance director on a congressional race out in Wisconsin, uh, and then came back to New Hampshire to start working on then um, uh, Maggie Hassan's first race for governor, uh, and was there as a deputy finance director, uh, and then when she won, was able to help do and execute her inaugural events, um, which was a really cool experience, planning an event for um, 400 people, um, and also what I learned is that planning those types of events in a professional setting can also be very helpful, because I recently um, was married, and that was certainly helpful for a personal reason as well. Um, and so, but things came full circle and I was really thinking about what I wanted from my career path and I didn't want to work on campaigns forever. And that's when I applied to the UNH Masters in Pub Public Administration program. Um, it worked well because it was classes in the evening um, and I was able to join the governor's office staff and work in constituent services. So I was able to work full time and do uh, full-time coursework and graduated in 2015. In doing that, was able to continue to grow in Maggie Hassan's governor's office um, and was able to stay on her team when she became a U.S. Senator. Um, I cover policy work for her in education workforce, disability inclusion policy. Um, I never planned on doing education policy. I had been doing international affairs uh, while I was an undergrad, I always say education policy kind of found me. Uh, it was something I really believed in. And now I, I look back and I'm like, oh, I never thought I'd be as excited about a policy work when I kind of stepped away from foreign policy as I am now about education and workforce uh, policy on the national level. Um, so 
what I'm doing now and uh, certainly look forward to continue to work on. But just in my current role, I support the Senator in uh, the different types of priorities we should be taking on. New Hampshire has a really low unemployment rate, which is great, um, but it makes it hard for businesses to uh, find the, the workforce that they need to fill valuable positions. So we constantly are trying to figure out ways to um, align more educational programs with area needs. Um, and it's been kind of fun to continue to be able to work um, with UNH on a professional setting as well. So um, it's been a great experience thus far. Great, thank you, uh, Brittany. Um, you know, I'll just chime in here so all three of these people uh, obviously start uh, kind of got into it through campaigns. And we have students right now who are work. We have students who worked on the Trump campaign in, in uh, 2016 and who worked on the Hillary campaign. We have, so it's one of the paths in is definitely working on a campaign, which now is the time to be uh, uh, doing that. Uh, personally, when I, I went straight into the think tank world, I just sort of, found a job working in that space. So there's different, there's different paths in, but obviously the campaign route is uh, particularly uh, timely now, whether it's, you know, presidential, but also just, you know, there's going to be a big election uh, uh, come next November and campaigns are staffing up now. Uh, let me just, uh, so each of you have, you know, as you've just described, uh, you know, your, your successful places in your careers. Uh, one thing I'd just be interested, you sort of described getting the bug to some extent, but I'd, I'd also just wonder if you've ever, if at any time did you ever think of, you know, instead trying to get a job with a Fortune 500 company and sort of working up in management, you guys could have been successful at lots of different things, I guess is what I'm saying. And what sort of drew you into doing things that were, you know, sort of more directly and, and intended to be societally impactful. Um, maybe Coralie, we could start with you. Sure. Um, so I, I think what drew me to Capitol Hill at first was that desire to just be engaged with what was going on in the world, but also it was a lot of fun. It was just a really fun place to be. I was 21 at the time and um, I stayed sort of on the Hill or in the campaign world until my early 30s and it was this sort of um you get caught up in it and um and that's part of it you get deeper on the issues hopefully you get a little bit um more poised and you learn them well enough to communicate them in a effective way and that's helpful but also it is just a fun place to start and i think um you know, now that I'm at Patagonia, which is arguably one of the most uh, mission-driven companies in the world, I think I still find that. I mean, it's very competitive as a place to work, um, and um, but the mission-driven nature of it keeps us all really engaged. We know sort of the marching orders every day on what we're supposed to do, and I find um, in, in your professional life, um, probably in any facet of your life, kind of knowing what the North Star is, is really important. And um, so the sort of that mission driven nature of the company, I think is what makes it special and makes us all want to be better employees and to do smarter work. Thank you, Brittany. Yeah, so um, when I was in, probably middle school, I really enjoyed history courses and I'd always kind of saw myself as a teacher. Um, and then in high school, I had this really amazing civics teacher um, and in learning and digging into government and what the process was and the what was at play there and how decisions were made, I, I had this full transition to, oh, I don't wanna just, you know, be learning more about history or teaching um, I want to actually be engaged in what that process looks like in real time. Um, so I think that was my, when I kind of got the bug to be in this like policy driven, where be at that level where decisions were made. Um, and then as far the campaign piece was just kind of part of that, but it certainly was never my, where I saw myself in the long term. So I think speaking to that like North Star of where you wanna be. Um, but I think it's also, I, I learned that I needed to be flexible about the different types of issues that I worked on. Um, and, but to always keep in mind, you know, 
Am I, do I believe in what I'm working on? Um, do I think I'm serving a greater purpose than, than myself? And that was always something that was really important to me. Um, and so I think that's kind of what brought me where I am versus um, working more in a private industry and not necessarily having that, so. So David, I've seen your ads and you could sell anything. <laughs> so uh, uh, how, how come you do what you do? Well, you know, for me, it was really sort of a little bit of a tension with my parents. You know, I, I came out of college and sort of kind of pitched to them the idea about what I wanted to do in communications and campaigns. And they were sort of like, wait a minute, what's all this? I don't think they really understood it. And they were sort of like, go to the Hill. Why don't you get a job? This sort of a legislative correspondent, a little bit more of the route I think Corley took, go do policy or whatever. My parents, you know, I still remember my dad, well, you can go to a banking and be a banking management trainee or, you know, whatever. And I just sort of pitched them on this idea that campaigns and communications was where I wanted to go. And I was lucky enough that I had parents that sort of let me try it and sort of, you know, go out and live on the road for three or four years doing campaigns and, you know, not making a lot of money. And, you know, like good parents, they sort of stuck with me. And ultimately, I think through what I became, they understood how powerful communications are, you know, and I sort of learned from myself and sort of taught them within our family. And as I think all of us have learned over the last 25 years, how important communications are, whether it's in, you know, communicating from policy and some of the stuff, Michael, you used to do in terms of like how economic policy or healthcare policy is communicated or what Corley does and how you're communicating on sort of social interests of, of, of corporations and what they're up to or political campaigns, what I do. And so, you know, that was sort of the, the sort of journey I had in my house and in, in, in my life on how I got to do it. And in terms of advertising, I have had that choice. I have. I've had a lot of corporate people come to us that you meet through campaigns. You often very, you know, uh, meet a lot of donors. You meet a lot of people around the candidate that do run companies and things like that that say, hey, that was good. You work fast. You're nimble political campaigns, you know, it's funny in the corporate world, you know, they'll take months or two months to put a whole advertising campaign together. Sometimes we're required to make an ad with, you know, what's in 12, 24 hours and turn it around. And, you know, for me, it's just about making a difference. So, you know, I've always, as I said, started in sort of the environmental world. I've been a little more progressive on, on my politics and, you know, I've been real comfortable sort of just doing it and trying to make a change. And, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to sort of make a business out of it. Great. Uh, so it's interesting. I, I mean, to some, uh, you've sort of, each of you touched on this a little bit, but I'd, uh, I'd be interested in hearing like to the extent to which in the back of your minds, you might have had a plan at any point or whether this was all just sort of, you know, one, one thing appeared in front of, in front of the other at different points uh in your in your career and one thing before i uh uh point at you um i just want to say I, I understand that jamie's audio wasn't great at the beginning just if you do have questions there's a box that you can type in your questions and then i'll sort of moderate the questions and impose them for those of you on the on the webinar so uh uh i don't know Brittany, why don't you st start like when did it become a plan i guess or did um it ever <laughs> so I think there's like a it's totally a mixed bag there and I, I meet with a lot of interns on the hill who are like tell me about what you did and um, I feel like I'm a broken record and kind of talking through my like life history um, and which is always kind of funny but it you have to I've always like looked back and been like I, I had to remain flexible but also keep the overarching goal in place so that overarching goal was always to work on public policy and to really be in that more official capacity. But that being said, like I was okay when I first graduated working on campaigns because I knew I was elevating, you know, issues that I cared about, but it was not through the way I ultimately wanted to do it in the long term. And I think so that was one way of I was willing to do that knowing that I still wanted to eventually end up in the policy sphere. Um, Whereas I think there are people that I've met who never were necessarily open to that track and wanted to go straight to Capitol Hill, um, straight into an official office, um, which is fine too. 
I think the other area was that I always really wanted to work on foreign policy and certainly crafted my entire undergraduate experience around that goal. Uh, and then I had, I realized, oh, I really am terrible at foreign languages. Um, this is probably not something I'll ever be overly successful about it. Um, a, a successful in my life. So maybe I should think about other things. Um, and then working for a governor, you also have to remove that a little bit because you're working on domestic policy. Um, so those were two areas where I, I tried to be flexible, but also keep the overarching goals in mind. And I think that I always encourage individuals to be really open-minded, but also do things that you enjoy um, and like, because that's the most important thing. Uh, David? Uh, you know, I'm not sure how it actually worked. I was lucky enough to have people that encouraged me. I mean, I knew I wanted to be a communications person. And I knew that like sort of whether it was communications for campaigns or legal conservation voters, or even working for a congressional or a Senate office as a press secretary was sort of my track, I think I was on initially. But I was really lucky that this gentleman, Joe Slade White, ran this advertising agency in New York, sort of took me under his wing and said, I need your communication skills in my company to sort of supplement and help my campaigns while I make the ads. The business was changing in many ways. Is that, you know, the, the advertising agencies like mine today sort of do both, as I mentioned before. You not only make the ads, but you also sort of are strategic advisors for the campaigns, kind of counselors. And he sort of had been a guy who is, grew up in a generation where it was just, he just sort of made the ads. And, and so he said, I want you to come help me work on these campaigns. And in the process, he taught me about advertising. He taught me about sort of the, running the business. And then when I sort of decided to do it on my own, it was a leap of faith. And the one thing I never thought about was running the business part of it. And that's probably the sort of, you know, it's not the, the funnest part, but you know, fundamentally my partner and I are small business people too, which is something that, you know, I never thought in my life I'd be doing. I'm just lucky enough to run a small business on doing campaigns and politics and consulting on, on things that I'm interested in. And so once I made the leap in 1995 and it kind of worked and I won a few campaigns, I've been sort of doing it for the last 20, 25 years. So, you know, one of the few people you meet that have actually sort of stayed in the same job for that long. Corley? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'm kind of the opposite. I have a new job, it feels like every couple of years. Um, and most of them have not been planned at all. Um, the only time I really planned a job was when I had sort of figured out I liked the policy setting of Capitol Hill, but I liked the competition and rat race side of campaigns. And somebody said, you should be a researcher. And, um, and so I talked my way into being a researcher in the 2004 cycle. Um, and that was really the only sort of plan for my whole career. Everything else has been about saying yes to good opportunities and to being, um, if I can say so, brave about big changes, um, including this most recent one. I'm an East Coast nomad and I have a really big and great set of friends and family on the East Coast. I had no idea about living in California, but the job at Patagonia felt really right. And it felt like the kind of job that would um, properly use all of the experiences that I had gained to date. And, um, and so for me, yeah, it was about, it's about saying yes and trusting my instinct. I think I also, like David, um, I benefited from really good mentors um, and that's kind of kept me going along the way. And um, this is a slightly different way to look at this question, but the other thing is I've accepted a lot of jobs that I'm not really qualified for. And I think that's kind of an important thing to do. And as long as you have a set of experiences to pull from, you can get through it. And I think you can oftentimes offer more than somebody who had a sort of very straight line path and just focused on one thing. And I, it takes all types. And when I'm hiring now, sometimes I am looking for somebody who's just been doing it for a long time and they know sort of the ins and outs of everything. Other times I'm looking for somebody with a really varied background um, because I think they can offer a different perspective that can be needed for smart communication strategy. 
Yeah, I hear you on the, I, I had a, a couple of jobs where it was sort of like, I don't know that I'm qualified necessarily, but I looked at the job title. And, okay, now what is someone with that job title supposed to do? You know, and that, and I sort of figured it out. So I, I hear you on that. Um, we have a couple, I, I, the next question I was gonna ask, and we have a, a audience question too that, that kind of relates to this. Um, I was gonna ask sort of uh, for people who are interested in careers like you've had and are engaging in, sort of what do you find the most satisfying and what, what is the most challenging aspect of that job? And it, it relates to another question named anonymous attendee, uh, uh, which was in campaigns and policy, you never go a day without dealing with opposition. So how do you deal with it and fight campaigns, camp, campaign slash, basically how do you fight burnout from being so, you know, in, in combat, you know, and you guys vary in how much you are daily in that, but um, maybe, maybe Brittany, we could start with you on that one. And just generally, what is the most satisfying and challenging aspect of the job? Um, so that's funny. I was talking about uh, this issue earlier because I often find that the most valuable and the most challenging are the same. Um, and I think, you know, in these roles, we're tasked with meeting a lot of different people, um, meeting with a lot of different stakeholder groups who all have their different interests that are quite siloed in what their own, um, what serves their own organization, their own interest groups best. Um, and having to figure out a cohesive strategy and plan as to how to serve the most people in doing that. And I think like in the education realm, like what stakeholders will you defer to the most and how you bring all those together. Um, so that's certainly something that I find really challenging, but also it's incredibly rewarding to come out on the other side with a robust product that you're able to get a lot of stakeholder groups to support. Um, even though they might not agree with 100%, they might agree with 70% of a bill, um, but they wanna be behind it because they know that you heard them out, that they that you took their feedback. Um, so that's always challenging. But I also, I mean, I think the, the burnout issue is real. And I think that, uh, especially in today's climate, like the, the gridlock in on Capitol Hill, um, you can work for years on, on an issue that never really moves forward and you have to just keep your um, focus and be okay and know that someday it could move and try to stay motivated. And I think um, building really positive, strong relationships with your peers who work in other offices, with mentors, um, who you can go to and talk through burnout, I think that's really important. Um, and, and having really good relationships with your colleagues so you can work through challenges like that together. Um, and I mean, because yeah, burnout is very real and everyone has their good days and bad days. And I think it's just good to call it out and work through it as it, as it comes. So David, satisfying, challenging, and burnout. Uh, challenging, I mean, uh, uh, satisfying, communications works. You know, that's one thing I love. I mean, whether it's at the research level, whether it's at the policy level, what Brittany and what Corley do, you can see the effects of like people making good policy and promoting it, people making, you know, good social change and what Corley does and promoting it. You know, again, Michael, what you used to do and sort of promoting, even promoting what we do here at the Carsey School and stuff like that. Communication matters. It's important for people to be educated and it's rewarding. And there are more and more platforms today to do that. And that's, that's great. A lot of communications today is entertainment. It's sort of, we have a word at our firm, it's called infotainment. You know, it's sort of like info information that gets out that actually entertains people. But communications is rewarding. And certainly on the advertising side, you know, we've won some great campaigns, you know, whether it's a lot of the women we've elected to the Senate Congress. Uh, we did the same sex marriage in Maryland a couple years ago that was really rewarding the state I live in. So we've, you know, done a lot of campaigns just at a mayor's race in Nashville where a friend of mine ran and we went from 2% literally to we ended up winning with 70%. So it's like those are rewarding, fulfilling things. On the other side of it, the burnout is real. And I think it comes from campaigns are intense little endeavors. You know, they're a year and a half long long, two-year-long little projects. And, you know, I always joke, it's like at the hardware store, if you have a bad sale, you know, the fall sale goes bad at the hardware store and you don't sell as much, you can always make it up in the spring sale. Well, in campaigns, you know, if it doesn't go right on November 6th, you know, there's no makeup sale. 
you know, and so the, the intensity that is brought not only, you know, with the opponents you're running against, but internally in your own campaigns is intense. These are people's lives on the line. Many people have given up lives, families, you know, their exposure and stuff like that. So the intensity, I think, it drives some tension. But, you know, we all deal with it, We, you know, uh, in our business. And I think that's one of the things we've learned to do and I've learned to do as a counselor to the candidate. I will say, though, Trump has changed things. And the disruption that both Trump has brought and the disruption in sort of how media is changing and how people communicate is a fun challenge. You know, there's some nights where everyone thinks things are disoriented and there's so much disruption out there. On the other end, for someone like me who's been doing it for 25 or so years, you know, this new platforms of how people are communicating and what Trump is doing for better or for worse, you know, he has changed things. And I think that's, it's sometimes it's challenging, but it's also rewarding understanding that. Thank you. You know, uh, uh, Corley, I'm going to, just because, you know, of time and I want to get to other questions, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, uh, I think I'll ask you and David this question that came in from one of the people watching, um, which is, what advice uh, would you provide to a junior in communications who is leaning towards media studies, and what kind of internship uh, should they be looking for for the summer of 2019? Great question. Um, so I can't say it enough that learning how to write really concisely and coherently is one of the most important skills you can bring to any job ever, especially a job in journalism, media, communications, PR, advertising, know how to write. And it's shocking to me how few people can craft um, really clear sentences. And look, it's fundamental in how you communicate with your colleagues, um, how you ask people to do things for you, which you find you have to do all of the time in the professional setting. Um, and so knowing how to write really well is really fundamental, I think. Um, as for a first internship, you know, I think um, kind of to David's point that the media environment that we live in right now is so interesting. Um, going to, if you can, a national newspaper or other kind of national media outlet would be kind of a fascinating place um, to start out. Um, being a, a press aide on a campaign or on Capitol Hill, also really great place to be exposed to a lot of, a lot of incoming. And I don't think you could go wrong with any of those three. Yeah, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot more media outlets now. I mean, there's major national newspapers, but there are all these online uh, things too. And I will just say, when we were uh, creating the Masters in Public Policy program uh, here at the Carsey School, one of the things I did was I went around to people I knew and other people asking them like, okay, when you're hiring in jobs that you would be hiring someone from an MPP, what are you looking for? And every single person said something about writing. So. It's actually is something we, we, we really focus in our programs, not just the MPP, but the other programs on communication skills in the context of, you know, policy and, and public administration and community development. So, David. Uh, I think Coralie nailed it. I don't have a ton to add. Uh, you know, the only thing I would say is if you have the ability, do get in the communication shop at wherever you're talking about. If you're truly interested in communications, you know, get in the communication shop in a legislative office, even in some of these media outlets today, have communication shops within the communications. You know, so Facebook has a communication shop. These newspapers and these outlets actually have communications that do communications internally in their own, uh, in their own organizations and externally. And so I would say no matter what level you could get in, you, you learn so much just by watching what happens in the communication shop, either in a, in a congressional office, in a Senate office, a legislative office, House caucuses, you know, and all the corporate uh, level communications Corley was talking about, that, uh, that, that that's where I would go. I would sort of get into the world that you want to be in at whatever level and, 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 and work hard and learn, 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 and as opposed to trying to make a kind of a lateral move from either a policy shop or something like that. Thank you, David. Um, so, 
I was going to ask you about how UNH experience shaped your careers, and maybe if you have anything to add to that, uh, you can add. But also, if you could just uh, say something about how you're connected to the Carsey School and, and, uh, and how you're sort of staying connected uh, to UNH. Maybe, Brittany, you could start. Um, so I received my master's in public admin administration before the Carsey School of had taken the MPA program, but still certainly feel some uh, connection there um, and, you know, stay connected with the school on Facebook, do things like this. Um, a way that I've chosen to stay connected to the UNH um, as a whole and in my life in DC is I'm actually the co-president of the alumni association down here. Um, so we do alumni events um, and, and that's a great way to, to stay connected with other alumni in the region. Um, and also to, there's some great annual events that UNH hosts. Um, we have one coming up next week with um, Senator Shaheen and uh, President Dean talking about um, global policy. And so the, it's been a really cool way to, to stay tuned in. Thanks, Corley. Um, so I, probably the most important way that I'm still connected to the school is the number of friends that I'm still in touch with and, uh, and visit with very, very regularly. In fact, I often go to Boston and then Atlanta just to make sure that I see everybody. Um, and I think the sort of, you can't overstate the importance of friends and, and back to the burnout question. I think one of the more important ways you can fight burnout is to lean on your friends and especially your friends that are in your same line of work, but even those that do things that are totally different. Um, I uh, reconnected with Michael at a Clinton event or something a few years ago and am now connected to the Carsey School, which has been great through the advisory board. Um, and I also stay close to a couple of the professors that I had, and it's been fun to kind of keep them posted on my career. A few of them have written books that I've gotten to help them research. Um, and so I feel like UNH is, um, is a big part of my life and, and all, in many ways kind of becoming even more a bigger part of my life, which is great. Thanks, David. Well, I stay first connected through my interest and love of hockey. Uh, my <laughs> wife works for the uh, Washington Capitals. And so I go to a lot of games and I see Rod Langway probably twice a week. And uh, I follow a lot of the UNH hockey grads. And uh, in addition to being politicized in my campaign work, I fell in love with hockey uh, uh, at UNH. So that's one thing that's important to me. The second thing is, is probably just the campaigns I've worked on in New Hampshire, certainly the relationship with, with Governor Hassan and then now Senator Hassan when she was governor. As Brittany can tell you, we did a lot of work on tuition, uh, you know, freezing tuition, working with the university and just sort of staying in touch with the politics and sort of the campaigns and even the Republicans, the Tom Rast and people like that. It's been a very bipartisan approach over the years. And now being, you know, hooked back in with Michael and the Carsey School, I think the this is awesome what, what the Carsey School has done and what Michael has done in the last five or six years here. And I see there's really sort of a three prong approach. It's not just the campaigns that sort of, you know, you have access to, but it really is the public policy, how you make a difference in sort of the city level, the county level, the county commission level, the healthcare, the stuff that you guys are turning out, folks that are sort of making a difference in people's lives because these, you know, these local issues matter more and more and you're training people for that. And then the third thing is people running for office. And I was just so excited. We were up there at a meeting the other day at an advisory board meeting and one of the graduates, the Matt Wilhelm gentleman who had been, he'd worked on campaigns, he came back and got a policy degree, graduate degree, you know, under Michael there. And now he's an elected official in New Hampshire. And I see those are the sort of three, you know, entryways into our world. It's you either work on the campaigns, you become a policy person like Brittany and actually make a difference, or you end up running for office. And the irony is Michael sort of brewed up a stew of everything right now. And I think that's the well-rounded approach that sort of makes a difference. And I hope we keep continuing on that approach. Thank you, David. We actually, I think, have uh, four legislators right now, graduates, two Republicans and two Democrats. So uh, and I should say, David and Brittany are both gracious enough. We, uh, for the Masters in Public Policy program, we bring uh, this, uh, uh, each class down to uh, DC uh, for a week, and they've been both nice enough to meet to meet with students when we go there. Um, 
So here's a question, actually. I'll go with this one. Uh, uh, this one's just for David. Uh, David, we watched the Facebook dilemma in class, which was Mark Zuckerberg documentary and how it affected the elections. When you were doing advertising, did you ever find Facebook as an issue for any of the campaigns you worked on? Yes, they're very pesky. Uh, <laughs> Facebook uh, does not have the same regulations that TV and radio stations and cable stations have. The Federal Election and Federal Communications Commission regulate TV, radio, uh, and cable stations in terms of what you're allowed to put on the air for advertising. You, you, they give you cheaper rates if you can do that, which is how they sort of enforce it. But they, re they regulate more closely than you would think, like what the content of the advertising is. And Facebook, as you saw from Zuckerberg's speech the other day down at Georgetown, is sort of really hiding behind the First Amendment. I know that's a crazy word. I sound like Trump, hiding behind the First Amendment. But he's using the First Amendment as you know, sort of a, uh, a, an excuse for them to sort of run any and all ads. And, and so, you know, they're, my experience is, you know, I've probably, we've probably submitted, let's say 2000 ads to Facebook and now they have a pre-clearance. You have to work with them about what gets cleared and they're cumbersome in terms of getting your, your sort of uh, relationship set up with them and things like that. But once you get an ad, you know, on the air there, they don't pull it down in terms of content, which you do run into with TV, radio, and cable stations if, if uh, your opponent sort of raises questions and brings the lawyers in. So they're an interesting company and in, in what they're doing, and they're, they're truly changing the world. I mean, they, the amount of people in campaigns, I can just tell you in terms of the research that we do of how people get information, Facebook is, is really one of the most powerful vehicles and platforms now. And it's not just young people. We're finding it's really skewing older and older and older. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a powerful, uh, powerful platform. Uh, the next question is, uh, I'd imagine that each of your roles requires you to build many relationships to be as successful as you are. How do you recommend someone break into your industry if they don't already have those connections? Uh, Brittany, why do you start? Um, so I would say is that don't overthink that. If you know one person, you know their network. So um, I think you, you start small and you go and you talk to the people you know, you talk to your professors, like you talk to who, and they'll connect you to their people. And you'll be really surprised as to how quickly that network blows up and all of a sudden you're you're at a networking event and uh, you're meeting 50 people who might be relevant to you. And uh, I do think, you know, being in DC now, something that I've struggled with is that like constant meeting new people, trying to make those connections. Um, but I often do meet with um, interns who are on the Hill and they're like, but I don't really want to go and talk about myself. And I'm like, no, but that's the point. People love it when you share what you've done, they'll share what they've done, you'll learn from each other. Um, and that's really the best way to, to get your foot in the door. And I would also say, you know, don't get overwhelmed if you don't have a connection with someone. I mean, if someone emails me, I'll meet with them. Um, and that's true for a lot of Hill staff. You know, you don't necessarily need to have a pre-existing relationship to do, an inform to do an informational interview with someone. Um, so I think, you know, emailing someone and saying, hey, I noticed you're a uh, UNH alumni. Um, I'd love to sit down with you. That's something that you certainly can do. So, um, but yes, I mean, a lot of it is connection-based. I got my first job because I had worked with someone who was a sitting state senator who knew me through doing some campaign stuff every job I've had except for one. Um, actually, even that, most of them have been based on some type of weird pre-existing relationship web, even if I didn't know it at the time and learned later. Um, so I do think that connections are important, but that you can continue to develop those and always feel like you can reach out to your UNH community and that's helpful. Yeah, and I, 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 if I'm, I'm going to just jump in and add two things. One is like one job I got because I played hockey with a guy, so you know you never, yeah, no, it you never get and tell. Yeah. But, but I, but I, I would, all, I would also say that keep at it. Like I have hired people. I mean, I'm thinking of one person because I just ran into him uh, 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 last week. Who I hired him in D.C. because he happened to sort of come in for an informational interview through no connection. He just like sort of literally walked in the door and I said, sure, I'll talk to you. And it happened to be, I was desperate to get someone with a skill set approximating his when he walked in the door. And so, you know, some of it is just like, you know, 
I wouldn't get discouraged is what I'm saying, you know, keep at it. Cause sometimes you can get lucky in the first time, first thing you try a uh, magic happens and you get the right connection, you get in the right door, but you know, that's just luck. Right. And sometimes it may take knocking on 30 or 50 doors before, before you happen to knock on the one where they're looking or they know someone who's looking for what you, what, you know, you have to offer. So, um, I, can, I just, um, add one quick thing. Um, just because of that example, Michael, that you just had, we had a UNH student who applied to be an intern because they were graduating early. Um, and they applied to be an intern in our office during their last, what would have been their last semester. Um, and we just happened to be hiring a staff assistant at the time and needed someone. And she became a staff assistant and within six months was a legislative correspondent. And so th it's, it's one of those things. So, and I always tell people to, especially on the Hill, because it is hard to get your foot in the door, even if a uh, position isn't exactly what you want it to be, um, certainly apply. And if you end up getting a job, that's great. But even if you don't, you have a, a relationship with the people who you interviewed with um, and they all think of you for future openings. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'll add one other thing to that, <laughs> which is just that one thing that advice I give to people, which they rarely take, but I'm hoping <laughs> people watching will, is that after you've met someone like that, like just keep in touch with them, like send them an email when you get a new job or something, because honestly, I've, I've met with a lot of people in these kind of informational things. And, you know, for a month or so, you'll be in my head, but six months later, I'm not thinking about you anymore, frankly. And so just like, but if you ping me six months later, because you got a job or you're still interested in whatever, boom, you're sort of at the top of my brain again. And then if I happen to know something that, you know, would be a fit, then I might, might help you out. Uh, Coralie, anything to add? Yeah, I totally agree with all of that. I would just add that um, do your homework on the people that you meet with. Um, and this is also true if you're reaching out to a reporter that you don't know. Like, look and see if in their bio there's something you can connect to. I always look to see if people graduated from University of New Hampshire. Um, but that can help just, like, make a connection to somebody that you don't have. Um, and will make it uh, make you a little bit more memorable. I totally agree with staying in touch with the people you meet with. Um, to this day, I get notes from <laughs> former interns who I asked to do that with me. And I'm like, who is this person? Oh, right. Yes, I know who you were. And it's great. And I think people do um, appreciate it. And it often does come full circle. David? I would concur with everything that's been said and just only double down on the fact that, you know, it's very, it's a very transient, that might not be the right word. It's a very fluid situation in terms of whether it's policy jobs, campaign jobs, communication jobs. There are a lot of them out there and don't be frustrated when they don't happen. More often than not, it's what Michael said, you're in the right place at the right time. And so, and even campaigns or, you know, Senate offices that say they're hiring up, they take forever to do it. So even at the times when you think people are hiring, it always takes longer than, than you should. So don't let the downtimes bum you out. And there's more jobs than you think. And just the last thing is, I think it's hard work too. I think the connections matter, but it's the relationships and the recommendations that matter in this business because there are so many jobs. And there are so many things that when people call us, our reputations are on the line when you're recommending to someone. And so if you've showed up on time, you've done good work, you're a good writer, as Corley said, and those kind of things, those things really matter. So no matter what level it is, you know, do the hard work. It sounds like I'm lecturing on that, but that, that, that matters a lot when you have a lot of high turnover. No, it really does. Uh, let me see. We had... Um... So David's kind of answered this, but maybe Corley uh, could touch on this. It's a little away from the career stuff, but how does the uh, ever-changing role of technology and social media affect your job? And what challenge does it provide to the career of communications today? Uh, sure. It's really hard to break through. <laughs> and I think that's, um, at least from my seat now, which is we're really struggling as a brand to break through to talk to communities around the world, but, but especially here in the U.S. about what's going on with our planet. And um, not to get into politics here, but there's been a lot of progress that's been rolled back 
under this administration on environmental issues and communicating about that is difficult and it's difficult in large part i think because of the digital media landscape also the way people digest information is different and confusing um and there's you know it's a matter of like finding that balance of a tweet a text long form video and everything in between um and it's also what makes it really exciting because when you do break through with the message um you've you've done something and you've maybe made some progress on protecting clean water or clean air or, or land okay so we are about at time but and so very quickly very quickly if each of you could just say is there one piece of advice uh that you would have uh that you know either emphasizing something we've already discussed or or something that we've missed to people who want to get into the business you're in so David. I, I think my, my advice that I give to folks is get in the silo you're interested in most at whatever level it is. And if you can, you know, you know, it's easy for me to say this hard to do. Some people can't afford it. But even if you're interning or barely getting paid, get in the division of the silo that you're interested in most and try to move up there. Because once you're in that silo, you're going to learn more about what you're ultimately going to do in addition to sort of showing your skills and doing that. So I just have found that to be the most productive of giving people advice over the years of go to the sort of what you want to do if you're truly interested in it. If, you're, if you don't quite know what to do, taking a job, you know, in a congressional office, on a campaign or whatever, and feeling your way through, you learn a lot there as well. Campaigns are always a good avenue to learn. Same being an LC on the, on the, on the Hill isn't bad or in the state legislatures doing that. But if okay, you- Okay, I'm cutting you off, David. All right, go. <laughs> so we're at the Corley. Um, Thank you, David. I would say find your passion and then keep your head down and work hard. You'll find that people are really good at promoting themselves. But in my experience, the people who work hard and do good work are the ones that rise to the top. And so just keep at it. But find your passion first. Don't do something if you're not happy. It's not worth it. Brittany. Um, I would just say that uh, don't get discouraged because your path, you can always keep that North Star goal, um, but your path might look very different than you thought it was going to. And like, for example, I thought that I would never come to DC once I started working in a governor's office. And then uh, a few years later, I had to decide to relocate and pick up my life. And uh, I think that now I'm here and it's it's great, but I, I think you have to just take life as it throws things at you and always look and think, am I enjoying what I'm doing now? does it work toward what I ultimately would like to be doing? And if you, both of those things are yes, then you're in a good place. And that's kind of how you should think about things and be flexible because sometimes things find you and they're the best. And then you'll look back and think, oh, I always wanted to do that. And I never would have considered it if I didn't get that opportunity. Thank you, Brittany. So we had one other question we didn't get to. Uh, if you want to give me a call, I'll help connect you with someone to answer that, or I'll talk to you. Uh, just in general, I would just like to, I'm going to hand this off to Jamie in one second, but i uh, just like to say, if you're interested in anything about the Carsey School of Public Policy, uh, we're easy to find online. So uh, get in touch with us. And thank you very much, uh, Corley, David, uh, Brittany. And now I'm going to hand this back to Jamie to take us out. We're doing the, the mic swap. We're sitting in the same room. So thanks for pairing with us. That's what happened at the beginning. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I just launched a poll. Um, we're always trying to improve our programming, uh, make things run better, improve our content. Um, so if you wouldn't mind before you jump off, just filling that out. Otherwise, I really sincerely appreciate all the time of our incredible speakers. You've got tremendous careers and great advice. So thank you for all of the time that you've put in. Um, not just in this very moment, um, each of you have really helped and worked with me and with Michael a handful of times um, before leading up to this day. So it's not just this moment, it's been all the moments leading up to this amazing webinar. So thank you so much and I appreciate it. We will have a recording of this webinar that we will send out an email to everybody who was able to be on in case you wanna revisit anything and we'll send it to the folks that weren't able to join as well. So um, keep an eye out for that. But thank you very much. I hope to see you at the next webinar that we host.